Uh, mm. uh, where am I? Uh, who? I don't. I don't remember anything. The last thing I. So. So fuzzy. Ah! Oh god! Sudden. Sudden flashes of. Of bad movies? Ah! God, make it stop. I. Oh, oh god! This. This is the blood dream! Welcome aboard, Dream Team. This is episode 22 of The Blood Dream, and I am your host, Jason Gray. And hey, Happy New Year. I know it's still a few days away, but I think we could all use a, a fresh start. Before I get into this week's episode, I've got kind of a major correction to be making about last week's. I decided to make my monthly, hey, so this is the music I use on the show announcement. And unfortunately, after I made that announcement, I decided I'm going to use different music for this very episode. So that came out a little awkward. Last week's episode had very different music from what I had mentioned. When I make the monthly announcement, it's for the general shows. Whenever I have episode-specific music, I will put it in the show notes always, with links going back to wherever it came from, if I can. Which brings me to the point that last week's episode, the music was all taken from Dexter. The original music was composed by David Licht, and the remixes, compilations, and uh, recomposition for my end titles all came from various people. Like I said, all the links to that are in the show notes, they're on the site, so you can find that easily. I gave the credit, just not in the episode. My bad, it's easy enough to find. That catches us all up to this week's episode, which I noticed lately I've been kind of being a little bit lazy and doing really short movies. I think it had been a good three or four weeks where all I've done are movies that are actually under an hour or right around an hour five. So for this week, I grabbed something that's actually a full-length feature, coming in at around an hour and a half. And spoilers before I get into the movie, this one actually should have been about an hour. So you know how this is gonna go. Still, it gave me a lot to talk about, a lot to digest. And the name of this week's movie is called The Grin. Or since they spell it with two N's, I'm calling it The Grinina. And really, what better way is there to ring in the Happy New Year than with a big smiling grinning face? I'm sure that can't go wrong at all. So that's our intro, that's my apology and correction. You got, you know what the movie is? Let's just dive right into the trailer. We get off to an interesting enough start as a Mr. Morgan is woken up by a ringing cell phone and answers it, most confusedly. The voice on the other end of the line keeps calling him Mr. Morgan, which is the only reason I know his name at this point. The guy doesn't seem to acknowledge it as his name and wants him to stop calling him that. But he doesn't know what he should be called, so we kinda keep going with Mr. Morgan for the time being. Good start, drop us into confusion with a bit of a mystery. I've already started forming some theories that I'll spoil now, turn out to be right, and you'll pick up on them as we go. We get a brief bit of a flashback to Mr. Morgan having a pillow fight with some woman, who we'll find out later is his girlfriend Diana. We come back from that, and he seems to have pulled himself together a whole lot, because he seems a lot more calm and collected, and he's a lot more with it when the mystery voice calls back in the first clip. Hello? Mr. Morgan, you sound much better than before. Will you please tell me what's going on now? I'm trying to figure out how to get you out of the house. Do you remember? We spoke not too long ago. Yeah, I remember. I'm seeing that you aren't able to reconstruct all of the things that happened that brought you here. I'm going to ask you to not walk into the dark. It will make more sense as you go along. There's something wrong with the kitchen. It's a byproduct of what you took. 
Consider what you can see, touch, smell, and hear as your safe haven. Nothing can get in or out. Once you pass beyond that, you're in a state of limbo, for lack of a better term. I don't believe you. Why don't you believe me? Because it's a fucking kitchen. Then by all means, roll the dice. It's still early, so the chances of them detecting your beacon is still slim. Just be ready to run back the way you came. And do not lose sight of the entrance. I think I'm gonna do whatever the hell I want to. Do you hang up? Well, that didn't make a single lick of sense. It actually does eventually, and it does support some of the theory that I'm having. But for right now, nope. Not a bit. So Vance, because that's his name, I know it from watching the whole movie, doesn't follow the advice of the voice on the line and goes into the kitchen, which is pitch black and full of whispers. And for the record, pitch black and full of whispers would make a really great album title. It's not long of wandering through the darkness until Vance comes face to scully face with the Grenina and finds himself right back in the living room. Vance starts banging on the windows to try to get out, but that doesn't do any good. He can't seem to escape the house no matter what. Doors don't open, it's pitch black outside, the windows aren't doing anything. For whatever reason, he is trapped in this location. He heads off to another room, and there is this weird transition. It seems like Vance is creeping up on himself at a computer. But then when we see the thing from the perspective of Vance number two at the computer, it's a woman that puts her hand on his shoulder. So, where are we? When are we? I don't know. And talking about this right now, something just clicked in my head, and you'll see where this is going in a little bit. But then Vance gets yanked out of that whatever it is, when there's a knock on the window, and we see the Grinina watching him. He mysteriously hears some running water, so check out the bathroom, and suddenly it's in another flash fragment of him with the other woman. Another phone call comes in, bringing Vance back to whatever passes for his reality here. And during the conversation with the mystery voice, there are two lines that stand out. So I used to live here, and you can't take it with you. These are pretty much the first clues that started me down the path of thinking that Vance is already dead. Because of the way they're delivered, they're said in a slightly awkward, not quite normal phrasing that no one would quite use, but it's not that far off, and if you're not paying attention, it would seem perfectly normal maybe. But, well, hear it for yourself in the next clip. So I used to live here, is that it? Yes, correct. So, where's all my shit then? I used to entertain, apparently. You're noticing changes, this is normal. So, where is it? I mean, if all my shit's here and I'm not seeing my shit, where am I? No one has touched your things, though at this point you really shouldn't be bothering with things like that. It isn't as though you can take it with you. Yeah, but... It's still mine. What have you remembered since the last time we spoke? Uh, I was sitting in this chair, just like I am, looking back at three people who were uh, looking back at me. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that um, this was a memory, right? Yes, you were remembering. That's cute. But the thing is, I don't think I was seeing the real deal. Glad to see you're coming along so quickly. Yeah, me too. So, but that's the deal, isn't it? I mean, I'm sweating my ass off. I, I feel like I got hit by a fucking pickup truck. And my head is spinning. I, I was poisoned, wasn't I? Poison, did you say? A poison, I did say. Try to keep up. That's how you're getting me to see all this shit, isn't it? I mean, poison or gas. I don't know, and frankly, I don't care. You don't want to kill me that much as a parent. So, what is this then? Is it about money? I don't even remember if I have any yet, but that's what this is about, right? That's disappointing. I looked forward to the connection I thought you were about to make. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint. You are correct, Mr. Morgan. And that what you are experiencing are not memories. They are the retouched versions of actual events that you have chosen to remember in their place. In time, you will see the actual event, and you will have to make a choice. So lay it on me then. What's the choice I need to make? And getting on your level, what's this terrible thing that I fucking did and am choosing to forget? Did I, did I bulldoze an orphanage? Uh, I rape a nun? And if what I did was so fucking terrible, why not just cut straight to the blackmail? Because that's where this is headed, right? Yeah, I did some fucked up shit, you show me the nitty gritty, and then I have to choose whether or not to write a big check. 
I admire your acumen. Even with dilapidated mental faculties, you come to the same conclusions many others have, much further down the line, and with much more information at their disposal. And yet you're wrong. Mr. Morgan is apparently not on the same page as me because he just thinks he's drugged. A reasonable assumption, no one's gonna go, dude, am I dead? There's more weirdness, more memories that are not memories, more getting yanked back to the present by the Grinina showing up. You get the drill by now. I'm feeling like this is a movie version of that video game subgenre that became popular a few years ago. Uh, what was the name of it? Uh, walking simulators? Your character wakes up in a place, has no memory of what's going on, walks around the apartment or the cabin or the, the forest. No memory of who they are, why they're there, and with every item they touch, you get a bit of the backstory. That's kind of what's going on here. We do get one lengthy flash fragment memory where Vance kind of stumbles his way through an orgy that's going on in his house and he's not participating in it. And he's kind of angry that his girlfriend is. He finally confronts her about this, and it's actually a really well-acted, delivered moment that's perfect for the next clip. Whatever you say, dear. Let me know when you get your grandfather's dick out of your oh, ass. Oh, and I'm the one being immature, and, and I'm the one complaining about my toys. Think about this for one, one minute, okay? To you, keeping my toys to myself is some ancient misogynistic credo. To me, you are my toy. You're my favorite toy. And to most people, normal people, they would love to have a boyfriend so faithful and he would rather go to bed with blue balls than fuck their girlfriend's best friend while she was in the other room. Yeah, babe, you got me. That's the difference between you and me. I'm so ashamed. No, 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 no. You are completely shameless. I see you're smoking again. You can't even not cheat on your own personal commitments. The difference between you and me is that while I may be your toy and you may be mine, you're not my only toy. And rather than be a stuck-up selfish bitch about it, I prefer to share my toys with you. Because like it or not, everywhere we go, be it the grocery store or nightclub, you're staring down the tits of every hot piece of ass that walks by. I was just trying to make you happy. By having me fuck Lauren. God damn it, fans. Even I fucked Lauren. Excuse me? Correction, I still fuck Lauren. For all the time we spend at the orgy, and even though that is a really nice conversation that I just shared, I'm actually glad this does turn out being somewhat important to the plot, or at least the characterization of Diana, and how she plays into the whole plot and life of Vance, because that scene goes on for a very long time, and not a whole lot happens aside from Vance is angry about all the sex that he's not having. Fortunately, it does eventually end as the Grenada makes his appearance and drags Mr. Morgan back to wherever they are. But immediately, we're dropped into another flashback, once again, this time with the other girl, the friend that came up to him at the computer. Her name's Lyra. And during this scene, we find out that Diana is pregnant and naturally is debating whether or not she wants to keep it. As well as just how sure or unsure Vance is that he's actually the father with the way that Diana likes to sleep around. Lyra says he's too good for Diana and he should think about leaving, and quite frankly that's probably some good advice, but he's in love and doesn't really listen to it, and we know how that goes. Vance and Lyra flirt for a bit, and eventually they get it on in the shower, which I think ties back to the earlier shower scene, but I'd have to double check to see if they are the same. It all starts out perfectly innocently with them just taking a shower together and kind of flirting. It's, it doesn't really quite go anywhere, but you can tell that Vance is really, really tempted, especially with the way Diana treats him. The Grenina naturally shows up eventually and does his thing. And you know, for a movie named after the guy, he sure doesn't do a whole lot other than stand around and wave. But the Grenina has shown up for his five second appearance, Vance is back in the house, but then it's almost immediately right back into another flashback. This time between Vance and Diana about what to do about the baby, and that's another good clip. Well, I don't know what you want me to say then. Wait, Vance, no, I'm sorry. I just... I just really want to know what you want. You know, if you agree with everything that I say, then it's all the same, you know? I just, I just want to know what you want. Please. How am I supposed to answer that question? I'm an asshole no matter what if I do. No, no you're not. I just... tell me. If I say keep it then I'm supporting the bullshit Mr. Rogers lifestyle that you clearly despise. 
If I say get rid of it, then I'm the asshole who can't deal with responsibility and commitment. And apparently, saying that I'll support you no matter what is also the wrong answer. So... I don't even know what I'm allowed to say at this point. I just want to know what you want. Why are you punishing me for wanting Because you want, you want a black and white answer, and there isn't one. How's that? We're not getting married. You made that quite clear. I mean, I wanted to marry you, but you shat all over that idea with the quickness. In fact, didn't you go out and fuck that Marine just to prove how not domestic you are? When I called you on it, I met at the door with sex isn't love fans. You do the exact opposite of literally everything I ask. So I figure I just keep my fucking mouth shut. That way there's at least a 50-50 chance I get what I want. You're not going to propose to me? I already did. No, no you didn't. You asked me if I would like it if you asked me to marry you. Not the same thing. You didn't even have a ring. What did you say, Diana? You had a ring. What did you say? Let me finish the thought for you. You took a good long look at me and said, I can't afford you. You would never be domestic. You would never need anyone. You don't need anyone. So I stopped imagining. Did I propose to you? Technically, no. I told you once. I won't ask it again. Ask me now. No. Please, Vance, ask me. This conversation is over. Do whatever you want. You're not going to listen to me anyway. Vance is riding this very thin, razor thin line between being understanding and being an absolute monster. And I get it, he's in a horrible position, his girlfriend treats him terribly, but at the same time he's also not being that understanding while the girl he claims to love and is the possible mother of his child is sitting on the closet floor weeping. We move on to yet another flashback, this time with Vance being blown by Lyra, when Diana comes home in a drunken, hazy mess. She is so out of it, she doesn't even notice Vance and Lyra doing their thing in the closet, and she starts wandering off, drunkenly singing. The two hiding out in the closet get back to what they were doing, until Vance notices that Diana has stopped singing. He knows something is wrong, rushes out there, and finds Diana has passed out because she took a whole bunch of pills. He asks her what she took, and, uh, dude, the bottle is literally laying right beside her head. Pick it up and take a look. Okay, okay, fine. He's probably just trying to keep her engaged, conscious, and talking. Vance keeps shouting to Lyra to do something. Help him out. Call the ambulance. Do anything other than just standing there, and wow, that is cold. It all winds up with us eventually coming around to another flashback, and Diana is having a really rough go of it, and I'm not sure if she actually went and had an abortion, or if taking the pills caused her to miscarry. The movie was either not very clear, or I blinked for a second and I'm the one that missed it. Either way, the baby is no longer in the picture, and Diana is not dealing well with it at all. Do you have anything to say to me? What? Do you have anything to say to me? Oh, baby, I can't even think right now. Just... Heroin does that to you. Can you run your fingers through my hair? Please? Like this? Uh, yes. Do you like this? Yes. Is it comforting? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Uh. Do you think our little girl would have liked this? What? We didn't know if it was Shut a girl. Shut your uh. mouth. So, you just get rid of it then. It doesn't fit uh, your beautiful life paradigm. Uh, just get uh, rid of it, right? Wait, wait, what are you talking about? Why does every woman in my life have to write so many goddamn ultimatums? What? I didn't give you an ultimatum. Love me because I'm beautiful, not because I have character. That's an ultimatum. We can't have children. That's a big deal breaker. And while I'm at it, I can fuck anything I want with a dick. Oh wait, you're bi. 
dick optional. I never said we couldn't have children. Then why did you do it? And while I'm asking stupid questions, why did you do it the way you did it? Because <sighs> I can't do this. I can't have children like this. Then get rid of it. Abort it the slow, <sighs> torturous, self-medicating <sighs> way. How incidentally advantageous that the one thing you want to do it every night just so happens to solve your other little problems. Color me shocked. <laughs> or maybe you're just a fucking junkie. Don't call me that. This wasn't easy. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. That's why you did it. And hence why it happened. But I can't be surprised. You did something reckless and without the say of your so-called life partner. And now I'm to assume that it was even mine? I knew it was yours. I never oh, said Oh, say it. what the fuck ever you want. I am so sick of giving you the benefit of the doubt. <sighs> Isn't it interesting how the only thing you hold true to are things that aren't provable or just happen to be said while I was out of the room? Oh, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. Oh, go ahead. Pass out. Pussy out of this. Just like everything else in your miserable little life. Pass out so I can drown you in gasoline. I hope you never wake up. Yeah, Vance has kind of reached asshole level at this point. I can still kinda see his point of view, but my empathy for him, because of the way he's expressing his concerns, is finding whole new lows. Right up until Vance threatened to outright murder her, there's still some hope for redemption, but once he crosses that line, I really don't care anymore. At, at that point, he becomes the bad guy. No matter what horrible things Diana has done at this point, it's all on Vance for being a, a massive shit. While Diana passes out from her grief and being yelled at, Vance and Lyra have a chat and start to plot her murder. Half-heartedly from Vance, a little more enthusiastically from Lyra in this point. Oh, and bonus, the mistress is now also pregnant. So Vance goes to get more pills, empties them out into a glass of wine, and he gives it to Diana to drink. But as she's laying there, kinda half out of it, Diana says a few choice things to Vance that hit him in just the right way that shows that even though she doesn't really show it, or express it the way a normal person would, she does, apparently, really care for Vance. So, oops, you done fucked up, Vance. Vance is freaking out and he talks it over with Lyra, and he started to realize just how much this woman has been manipulating him throughout this whole thing by this woman who claimed to love him. And that's a good next clip. What did we just do? We bought ourselves freedom. We can't do this. It's already done. All we have to do is wait and call the police. Excuse me? Yeah, we're gonna call the police. We came home from wherever and found her in bed, just like she is. It's perfect. I mean, come on. You saved her once during a suicide attempt. This is a crime we practically can't even admit to. And no one would believe us, even if we did. And she handed it to us in a nicely wrapped package. Like a wedding present. This isn't happening. Trust me. They won't even consider you a suspect. <clears throat> what are you thinking? Baby, what are you gonna do? Diana calls me. Not you. Who the fuck do you think you are? For your information, I'm not worried about getting caught, or prison, or heaven and hell, or getting my name in the fucking newspaper. Yeah, it's starting to be real clear to me now. It's starting to look less like you and me, and more like you and what I can get you. In fact, how the fuck did you even know to show up that first night? I don't remember calling you. God, I need to have my fucking head examined. Vince tries to call someone to get help for Diana. Lyra loses it and comes after him with a knife. He manages to get a hold of the knife and make Stabby on his second baby mama, and then go ahead and drown his sorrows in booze for a bit. 
and is suddenly sitting across from a guy who I believe is the voice that was on the phone earlier in the movie. Mysterious voice tells Vance that now he knows exactly what happened, and Vance expresses a lot of regret over everything and how badly he fucked up. There's been a lingering question that the movie brings up every so often. They don't dwell on it too much, and it's just a simple question of, where did Lyra even come from? And it wonderfully plays on the expectations of the audience of just accepting, oh, she's a friend that Vance is talking to to get advice about what to do about Diana. It's a perfectly normal thing, but it's played as just being a little bit off, and we shouldn't just accept it because it's what normally happens in movies. A person just appears that they apparently know. The movie then goes through a series of flashbacks that repositions all the scenes we've already seen with Lyra, but now without her in them. It's revealed this friend, this Lyra, never even existed in the first place, and has always been just a figment of Vance's own damaged mind. Vance comes to realize that all the medication in the house is actually his for his mental condition, and he confronts the mysterious voice about this in the final clip. This is a trick. You're trying to trick me. Why would I do that, Vance? This was never mine. This shit was never mine. Like how you never drank beer? That's different with that. You didn't remember. Well, no. So in your mind, it's more likely for you to remember someone that doesn't exist? Bringing you a beverage you never drank than to forget the owner of the medication in the house? I don't think I follow your logic. I'm not lying. I didn't remember. For a man that purportedly drinks only wine, you sure do carry around a flask a lot. What do you drink, Vance? Wine. What do you drink out of your flask, Vance? Wine! You're still lying to yourself. I'm not lying to myself. I drink wine. Alpha retards and jock assholes drink beer. I am a writer. I, I listen to Mozart. I review stage plays. I drink wine. Why do you drink it out of your flask? Diana gave it to me, okay? As an anniversary present. She said, here's to new things, Vance and gave it to me just like that. Are you trying to convince me or you? I know you well, Vance. I've done my homework and from what I've found, you never drink anything but red wine, this is true. Also that the flask was not for your anniversary but a birthday present. Does it even matter? Remember why you threw it off the pier? I was angry. Why were you angry? I don't remember. I don't believe you. Because she got it from me the night of the party she was hosting, okay? She was at the store buying the alcohol. It wasn't even a real birthday present. This is what made you angry? No. What was it? It wasn't my kind of party. Why did you host it? I didn't. Diana did. She, she told me she was hosting a party that weekend. I, I thought it was for my birthday. But she, she never said that it was for my birthday. I just assumed that it was. So come that night, I text her, Hey, thanks for throwing me a birthday party. When she got it, she was at the store buying the alcohol for the party. Realizing that it was my birthday, she picked up the nearest thing that she could find. There. Are you happy? Does that solve the mystery of the fucking flask? Why wasn't it your kind of party? Because it was a disgusting swingers party. I only met two of these people before, and was it five minutes into it that everyone started feeling and groping on each other? They didn't even touch the alcohol. And, and then Diana starts grinding on Brad. She tries to get me to fuck Lauren so she could fuck him, and they were dating for fuck's sake. And then you realize the party had nothing to do with your birthday. Fucking A! Are you telling me you wouldn't be pissed? So I drank. I drank the hard stuff. Just like the man I thought Diana wanted me to be. And I wasn't used to it. And I got trashed. And then I started fighting with Diana in front of everybody. I chased everyone off, including Diana. So when everyone was gone, I walked out of the pier and I threw that piece of shit flask into the goddamn ocean. Then why do you carry it around with you? I don't. I threw it off the pier. Remember? Vance? It's in your pocket. So gasp, surprise, Vance has actually been dead for 11 months, and the mysterious voice is the medium that has been hired to cleanse the house of his restless spirit. So now that Vance has come to terms with everything that's happened to him, it's time for him to leave and move on, but he still has to have a little visit with the Grinina. Oh hey, remember that guy? Sunlight finally dawns on Vance's otherwise dark world, and he waits and waits as he tries to accept what he has to do next. 
Darkness falls again as the Grinina shows up to do whatever he's going to do, and how is there still 10 minutes left to the movie? Oh right, because while Vance may have said that he's ready to move on, he then sits on the bed for three of the last 10 minutes. And then even more flashbacks to what really happened without Lyra being there. Like we needed more of that at this point in the movie. We get it, Lyra didn't exist, we can wrap our heads around the concept, you don't have to go through every scene she was in and show us how it really played out. We get it. And aside from, like, a brief moment back in the real world where the mysterious voice is going through the house, cleansing it with Sage, and a few last comforting words with Diana, that's pretty much the end of the movie. It really did end, like, ten minutes ago, and then just kept going and going. I really love this idea for the movie. And the darkness of both characters is deep and strong and actually well-realized for a movie of this nature. You actually feel for them despite them being really messed up people who do a lot of horrible things to each other because they're written with such depth that they feel like real people. They're broken, they're messed up, their relationship is messy, but they do love each other in their own weird way no matter how messed up that love may be. And while I do like it, you do see the twist of Vance being dead coming a mile away. I called it in like the first five minutes of the movie, but I still thought it was handled very well. It takes a while to get there, and the movie is probably a little bit too padded out, but for the most part, the central mystery does unfold in a fairly decent manner. Just because the audience sees it coming, doesn't mean it can't be an interesting and worthwhile journey to see Vance going through it, and coming to the same realizations. The main problems with the movie is that the script is really overwrought in its melodrama, and at times, the acting can get really hammy and very scenery-chewing. And ultimately, it really is too long of a movie for this sort of idea. There is a lot of time spent sitting around, and lots of scenes we really don't need once we get the twist of it all. This easily could have been cut down by 10, maybe 20 minutes, and there really would have been little to no difference in the story or characterization we're given. I say that maybe it could even be 30 minutes less, but that might actually be pushing it. It's a good story with some overacting, just told over way too much space. So that was The Grin. I'll do it right the final time. And this has been The Bloodstream. If you've enjoyed listening to this episode, you can find more on iTunes, where you can subscribe, like, rate, and review the podcast. Just search for The Bloodstream. We're the one that's not a medical podcast. You can also search for us on Facebook and find the group there, join in the fun, and get updates on whatever's going on. Like this week, you would have seen my explanation of why this episode is a day or two late. I can also be found on Tumblr at thebloodstream.tumblr.com. You can also always find us at triscadecafiles.com where I do other reviews of horror movies. And if you have any questions, suggestions, movies you'd like me to review, you can hit me up at any of those places and drop me a line. Or you can always just send me an email at phoenix, F-O-E-N-I-X, at gmail.com. That's phoenix with an F. So thanks for listening, and keep streaming.
don't worry. <laughs> It'll only hurt. A lot. <laughs>